How lovely to be here. It sounds like you've had a phenomenal day. And how special to be here with you, Jeff. Thank you. Nice to be with all of you. Thank you for the invitation. Now, uh, at the end, if we have time, we've got to get back. You and I missed, apparently, a powerhouse session with Letitia. And I just learned that Mr. Jeff Birding is a citizen's special agent of the FBI. So hold questions. But if you want to go back there, I've just opened that door just for you. Uh, Jeff, today our game changers have been discussing executive leadership presence. And they each have written and recorded their personal elevator speech. Why don't we start there? What would your elevator speech be? Hi, I'm Jeff Birding, co-founder, uh, president and co-CEO of FC Cincinnati, uh, our region's major league soccer franchise where we aim to inspire and unite Cincinnati as a community of champions. Uh, we focus on maximizing community impact, uh, and being an inclusive, family-friendly club. Uh, and uh, we aim to bring team members into our organization who want to have fun, who want to see uh, their own career develop, and also for the legacy of being a part of something bigger than themselves. And I invite all of you to be a part of that and experience FC Cincinnati in some fashion. I love the connection to inspiration, community impact, the welcoming nature, and um, you know, obviously what we do goes far beyond the dollars and cents of business, uh, and it's around creating connections, so that's really special. Um, that is awesome. In the room today, we have women working in corporate roles. We have women as entrepreneurs. And FC Cincinnati was originally founded in 2015. How many people went to games at Nippert Stadium? Wow, thank you. How many have gone to the incredible TQL Stadium? You got some, some powerhouse fans in here too. Um, but FC was originally founded in 2015 as a startup and obviously you know, through growth, uh, through the support of the community, uh, you've had to drive a more corporate structure to support that evolution as well uh, and becoming you know, part of Major League Soccer. Can you share with the group a little bit about that evolution, a little bit about the leadership lessons uh, that you've realized over the last few years and, and frankly, the years leading up to sure. even you know, getting to the USL? Sure. So a um, couple just brief little uh, ingredient parts. Um, I grew up here in Cincinnati, and my first love of my life was the Cincinnati Reds and the Big Red Machine. And I came back to Cincinnati, like many do, to raise uh, our own families. And my kids love soccer the way I love the Reds. And my children's favorite team was in Manchester, England. And I thought they were so missing out on not having that civic connection to a team in their own hometown in the sport that they loved. Uh, because I knew what the Reds, the big red machine meant to me as a kid. And so I was probably somewhat audacious enough to think that I could pull this off uh, to give my kids a professional and, and future generations and families um, a, 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 a major league team, a professional team in the sport that was the, is the fastest growing sport. In the, it's the most popular sport. Just as an, There's more people playing soccer on this planet than every other sport combined. Um, and because I'm a proud Cincinnati, and I wanted to represent Cincinnati to the world and bring the world to Cincinnati, and new soccer was a vehicle to do that. So um, when I started uh, this um, effort uh, and had the opportunity to partner with Carl Lindner, uh, the, I, I recruited people to be a part of FC Cincinnati really in this sort of manner. And this would speak to the leadership question. Um, who here th might think it would be awesome to climb Mount Everest? Anyone? Okay, a a a a a quite a few people. It sounds awesome. I've climbed only Mount Kilimanjaro, which you don't die headed up to Mount Kilimanjaro. But climbing Mount Everest sounds great until on the path you see people dying and you come up, step over dead bodies and then it doesn't sound so great. And the reason I'm using that example is because I recruited and led the organization like the Sherpa that is getting everyone to the top of Everest. You're gonna get the best selfie at the top of Everest. And, and sign on to be a part of creating something bigger than 
yourself. You will have the legacy of creating a major league soccer team here that no one will ever be able to take away. And there was a small group of us, and I was a hands-on leader, and I was the visionary inspiration, but I was also very involved in everything. And to be fair, so were the other team members. And we were successful. We got into Major League Soccer, and we built what we envisioned doing, the best soccer stadium uh, in this country, right here in Cincinnati. Um, and we survived COVID, which was just unbelievable as a startup leader. We're literally, you, you have no playbook. There's no idea to what is the right call. And uh, I, I give you that to say, we opened the stadium, survived everything, and a third of the people who worked for us, at the time there was only around 75 people, quit. Because my leadership style was not sustainable. They were like, Jeff, we, we joined you, we, we, we got our legacy piece, we, we did it, and we're out. Um, because it was just too intense. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, to be fair, I think the pandemic allowed for further introspection and evolution of how we want to be present in work and what is the purpose of work. And it was just too intense. And I'm a visionary where I was saying literally, we're not going down to base camp. We're just going over that ridge and K2 is right here and we're going to summon another one. And people are like, I ain't in for that anymore. Mm -hmm. No. Um, and so then our team, of course, we had the quickest transition, our team of four. Uh, and so our product, if you will, for many was the most visible piece was poor. And um, so I had to go through real significant personal growth and evolution as a leader because otherwise you hear many stories for the entrepreneurs here of the the startup visionaries who get it done, but then they finally succeed and they're ushered out the door because the people that gave you the funding are like, you were the visionary, but you're not the one to lead this thing as a mature, sustainable organization. And so I joined a Vistage group uh, for my own CEO development um, and uh, put a, a, an executive leadership team around me uh, who have their own senior leadership team under them and I really focused on diversity. I'm proud to say there's an article in the Business Courier this morning, half of my executive leadership team is women. Um, in professional sports, that's very rare in professional sports. And really, they run the day-to-day. -day. I'm still the visionary, and um, we, we're almost a billion-dollar uh, enterprise right now, and um, we just, uh, Major League Soccer just reported to us at our owners meetings that we're $27 million better than the average MLS franchise um, uh, in the smallest media market. So we're, we're, we're gonna keep growing, but my point is I, I'm, it's now more of an invitation to go up to K2 yeah, yeah. and maybe we'll take a lot, little bit longer and we'll be a little bit more prepared and it won't just be rushing headlong, uh, which is sort of, and the reason is, is I was in a hurry because I knew that other cities had not figured out what the opportunity was with Major League Soccer. And they weren't going to say, well, we have to have Cincinnati. And so we had to beat other cities. Charlotte figured it out after us. Nashville figured it out after us. Vegas, San Diego, like all these other cities, which would have been the more natural than Cincinnati. Yeah. But, it, but once we got it, I did realize that's not sustainable. <laughs> And well, I have well, to change. Um, well, I think what a humbling moment, right, to get across. I think we're all grateful for the rush because we're grateful we have FC Cincinnati here. Yeah. Fair. Yeah. But what a humbling moment for you on the other side to have, you said, a, a third of your, of your talent uh, that brought it across the line to leave. But what an incredible leadership moment to recognize how to lead differently in this next wave because you're right. You hit these moments in business for entrepreneurs and business for the corporate teams. Everybody is on a rush for a deadline to get something done because of something that sits on the horizon that we've committed to and that recognition of how to bring everybody along with us on that journey um, to, to take the field, to take the pitch. Uh, that's, um, that's an awesome lesson to share. Thank you. Thank you. Today is tagged as the art of the pitch. So speaking of pitch, uh, not pitch, if you're at Manchester United and talking about a field, a soccer field, but um, well done, Jackie and Rachel, on the coordination of that. Well done. Hopefully all the soccer fans in here got that. 
Um, the art of the pitch uh, was uh, the anchor point for today. Um, can you share some highlights of your most successful pitch? And then let's get real on the pitch that failed miserably that you'd love to get back. Okay, well, the, the, the most successful one, there's two, there's two parts of, of this. So we have the USL franchise, and we have a great first year, and we're invited at the end of the first year, so this is 2016, December, to participate in MLS expansion. Carl and I had gone up to New York to meet with Don Garber, wanted to make sure Cincinnati had a pathway. They said, you know, if you do well, of course. Uh, so after our very first year, they invite us to prepare a bid for MLS expansion. I mean, we barely knew what we were doing as a USL team, but I have to now envision an MLS franchise. So it happened a little bit more quickly, but because we were in a hurry, we weren't going to say no. So anyway, we spend a whole year and we figure out how we're going to raise all the owner equity. Of course, Carl being the biggest piece, but we had to bring more owners on board, uh, mostly all Cincinnati folks, um, and a stadium plan and a training facility and sponsors and uh, a pro forma uh, on, on an MLS franchise and, and more of a leadership team and whatnot. So anyway, a very ex ex uh, extensive bid, which we submitted sort of an outline of it and then there were four finalist cities that were invited to come present. And so Scott Farmer from Centos is going to present a part, and Carl Linder is going to present a part, and John Cranley at the time is the mayor. He's going to present a part. I'm going to present a part. And uh, literally, so I fly up the night before to make sure if there's a plane issue, someone from Cincinnati is going to be there. And anyway, so we go in, uh, into the green room where we're going to present. And Carl walks in, and the rest of our group is there, and he uh, pulls me aside and says, um, I just want you to do the whole thing. And, uh, and he said, look, you put the presentation together so you know it, so I just need you to do the whole thing. Because um, I don't really, I'm not feeling great. I don't want to speak, and if I don't speak, then Scott, and so you just need to do the whole thing. So certainly I was prepared. It's like T minus five minutes to go. Literally. Go so we walk into our, the green room, and Carl says to everyone, hey, Jeff's just going to do the whole presentation. Okay, so anyway, we go into uh, the MLS uh, uh, conference room, and there's Don Garber, and there's about six team owners, and then a bunch of staff and lawyers and everything. And so we have our PowerPoint presentation, and I just literally for an hour just did the whole presentation and was really passionate, and I was like back and forth with this owner who says, oh, these numbers are smoke and mirrors. They don't do that in merchandise. We did $2 million a year in um, uh, merchandise. And I said, no, that's true. Charles, the guy from the, and he's like, no, we looked at the books. It's true. And uh, I said, yeah, that he, this guy says, this owner, that's more than every MLS franchise. Uh, and I said, and that's why you're going to pick us. Um, <laughs> and so at the end of it, literally, we walk out, and I said to Carl Linder, congratulations, you're an MLS owner. Total confidence. And of course, yeah, we were. So the second part of the pitch, which I think is great, is one of the other cities that we were competing against was Sacramento. And um, Sacramento did not get picked. It got, was Nashville and Cincinnati. And so uh, we're going through our stadium. And I mentioned our goal was to build the best soccer stadium uh, in the US. And my ambition is really sometimes bigger than my checkbook. And so the stadium was $125 million over budget. Like almost double the cost. And Carl's like, look, you know, we can go 100 million over, but you're going to have to find a, a partner for us to put up that kind of money. So we'll cut 25 million out, but we need 100 million in additional equity. The lead investor of the Sacramento franchise was former PG -er Meg Whitman. So I, I had someone who was working for us, our investment banker, call her family office and said, okay, she's not going to be the number one in Sacramento, but how about being number two in Cincinnati? And uh, much less risk, cost you less money, the whole thing. So we had a call with her adult son, and then he calls me on a Friday and says, um, hey, uh, what are you doing this uh, weekend after the call? And, uh, and I said, well, the Bengals season starts on Sunday. I was planning on going to the Bengals game. He says, well, my mom's on a board in Chicago for a meeting Monday morning. Why don't you fly up to Chicago and have dinner with my mom? So I was like, okay. So I fly up on uh, Sunday and have a three-hour dinner with Meg Whitman. And it was, I mean, I just can't even begin to tell you. It was awesome. 
like in terms of a big pitch MLS expansion, one-on-one -on -one pitch, I'm asking Meg Whitman to write a $100 million check. <laughs> and she's never met me before. And literally after three hours, she was like, let's, let's, um, let me get my family together. We're going to fly to Cincinnati next weekend to meet Carl and his family. And uh, she was in. So that was pretty awesome. I love that, too. Uh, can I ask, um, for no real reason, just curiosity, where did you have this three-hour dinner? Um, there's, she was in a hotel, and we had dinner in the restaurant at the hotel. She was staying. I just didn't know if there was a restaurant. We, literally we, closed, we closed it. The dinner was like at 8 o'clock. <laughs> you know, when she flew in, and so yeah, it was, went till 11 o'clock, we're the only people left in the restaurant. And if you're taking her to Ditka Steakhouse, no. or where you're going, no, you're just no. at the hotel, all right. No. Big then, deals get done at hotel restaurants. That's then, mental the, note. The, the least successful one, because I already think I gave you two really good ones, is I also pitched some pretty famous people to be uh, part of our ownership group, um, including we invited the Bengals and the Reds on two separate occasions, each of them, to join in, and uh, and neither of them were interested. We got some other big Cincinnati uh, Clooney. He's, is he in? He's not in. Is he in? I don't know. I've not looked at all the no, investors. George, George Clooney is not. But there are some other yeah, big time yeah. Cincy folks. Well, George missed the boat. George missed the boat. Um, those are great, great stories, and um, quite a success. Thanks. Quite a success. Uh, so our game changers here are doing pitches all the time too. Uh, some pitches you know, individually for themselves, pitching promotions, pitching raises, right? talking about themselves and the impact and the influence that they have, the contribution that they're bringing into the organization and making sure they have the right value associ association on the other side. Some pitching products. I'm with Kroger. I'm sure some of you are pitching products to get on our shelves amongst a sea of other retailers. Can you share a little bit about how you think about the audience that you're getting ready to pitch to, the preparation, that clearly that is critical because uh, you can't fall flat in the first no. moment. No. Uh, I, I'm by no means an expert in marketing. I, I, I joke, I know a little about a lot of things. So it, I, I'm not a scientist on the pitch. What, what, what I would just offer is I think being prepared is enormously Im important. Um, what is the background of the audience? I knew a, uh, as much as I could find out about Meg Whitman. I knew everyone who was going to be in the room for the MLS expansion committee. And I knew sort of the state of their organization and what would be Cincinnati's strong points and also what would be our weak points in it where I might get questioned and um, to, to uh, address it. Um, and what, what they're looking for. I knew what Meg, I had a pretty good idea of what Meg was going to be looking for um, and uh, I had a pretty good idea of what the other MLS owners in the expansion committee, how they'd be sizing mm -hmm. us up. And I think that that preparation is, um, is, is so vital because I think your pitch is largely going to be the same. Like if you think about it as sort of a box, it's largely going to be the same regardless of the audience. But you, as you noted, you could be pitching your products, you could be pitching investors, and so then it's going to, Right, at least pivot yep. uh, a, a little bit. Um, I always say it with preparation allows you to be sort of cool, calm, um, concise, um, clear, have a, a level of clarity um, because you're just speaking as a person. Um, and if you're prepared, because there, you always have to assume they're not. You're not just being sized up in your pitch by the words that you say, but in the manner of which you present. And if you communicate a level of confidence, um, that might inspire me to have more confidence in you. If you don't have confidence in yourself, why am I buying what you're selling? That's right. Um, so, and, and then of course, the, 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 the call to action, making sure that what you plan for your call to action is gonna be met with some level of reasonableness like if I had asked Meg for a billion dollars, not reasonable, a hundred million, you know, she's done quite well. Um, and, and, and so th that also goes to the preparation. Um, in, m in my little pitch here earlier, I invited all of you to experience FC Cincinnati in some way. Now, maybe that means that you're looking for career growth and, and maybe being a part of our 
um, internal team is away. Maybe you represent companies that would like to sponsor FC Cincinnati and leverage uh, that catalytic energy together. Uh, maybe the way you experience us, you come to a game. Uh, so I think those are some of the key points yeah. that at least I think about when I think about making a pitch. I loved your comment on know your strengths and know your weaknesses uh, and attack it. Some of the stuff that we work with uh, at Kroger and some of, I lead the media sales team, uh, and when they go in for pitches asking for uh, money to invest within our assets, uh, we tell our team every single time, know, know your strengths. What are the reasons to say yes? Make sure you make those, make those moments matter. But more importantly, what are the reasons that you know they're going to say no? What's on their mind? And if you can attack that in your pitch, so you squash it before they can ask it, they, they, they will put that to the side and then you keep running forward. Same, sure. uh, same game plan, uh, all right? Make, what are the five or 10 reasons to say yes, five or 10 reasons to say no, use that in your preparation. Well, as you think about maybe the, the kind of dissecting your pitch, are there, are there specific points, one, two, three specific points? I mean, you've got to have the ask that's really sharp. You've got to, you know, obviously be seeding through. Uh, do you, as you frame, you know, use that framework, are there three things that you think about on kind of building and dissecting that pitch? Just to simplify the framework for everybody in this room. Um, I, I think a big, a, a big part is just the introduction because that's the, usually the first thing. And you either, you know, um, um, uh, Jerry Maguire, you had me at hello. Everyone know that movie? Okay, you had me at hello. You can also lose them at hello. Uh, and so I think the introduction uh, is, is very critical to be compelling enough that you're inviting someone in to hear um, the next part. And the, the, the next part usually is some level of problem solving that People have gaps, people have challenges in their lives or in their companies, and how can we be a part of solving that for them? Um, and, and I wanna be clear that it doesn't have to be so transactional either. I mean, when we invite people to come to FC Cincinnati matches, you don't have to be a soccer fan. I say half the stadiums filled with non-soccer fans, but you get to be a part of some energy and some excitement and have some fun, and it's only two hours, and you'll connect with people. We have people who, uh, our Bailey, which is the area of the stadium that is the smoke and the drums and the cheers, they describe themselves as the band nerds in high school, the chess <laughs> club. Like, and they say, this is the first sporting team that I've ever felt welcome and that we have, I have claimed as mine. And my point is the, the friendships and the relationships that have come out of people who come to our games in, in, uh, is just remarkable and I am always so fulfilled to hear the stories. And my point is that they had some gaps in their life where they were looking for more, whether that be with friendship or experience or connection to our city, and we aim to fill those gaps. And that's so much bigger than scoring goals. Mm -hmm. um, so th that would be the second part of what problem are we really trying to help someone with? Uh, and then of course the third is, I mean truly is the call to action. What's the ask? And I, I, I have been with people, and, and I always somewhat have a little bit of a smile, who they do the first two parts really well and then there's no call to action. So I'm like, well nice meeting you and I walk away. And I know that they probably really did have a call to action that they were really, and so I'll sort of go, okay. And then they just don't do the call to action, so, yeah. okay. Courage, conviction, be ready, make the ask. Yeah, let, let me just give this. Some of you may know that I'm a recovering politician. I used to be somebody. <laughs> I was on Cincinnati City Council for six years. Um, and I, I, I ran three times and I won three times, and then I traded City Hall politics for youth soccer <laughs> politics. <laughs> But the reason why I'm bringing that up is, in my three elections, I raised, uh, combined, over a million dollars. And the most you can give is $1,000. And, and some elected officials don't like asking for money. And I'm not saying I loved it, 
but it, I can't say I didn't enjoy it. Why? I believed in what I was selling. I'm selling me. I'm out there solving problems. I'm not playing politics. I have a full-time job. I don't need the money. I'm just trying to be an adult in the room moving this city forward, not thinking about the next election, but the next generation. And there are not enough of those folks, And so, but I need your money. And so will you give me $1,000? I see you've given $1,000 to this politician, this politician. Like, so I know you can afford it, so my call to action. But if you're not confident enough about what you're selling to make the ask, most of the time people ain't offering. And so it really does come with believing in what your, your pitch is, what you're selling. I bet there's some great stories on the difference between city politics and youth soccer politics, because my daughter's in youth soccer with a different club than Jeff was very intimately familiar with. Um, and I also coach her basketball. There's politics in every youth sure. sport. It's incredible. Uh, I'm going to shift gears for a final question here, but we will have time for one or two from the audience. So uh, th think about what you might want to ask, um, the art of the pitch. Um, but we're going to shift in for this final question about leadership in the community, which is a nice segue. Uh, you're active in the community, serving on a number of boards, including Visit Cincinnati, uh, Cincinnati Regional Business Committee, along with, of course, uh, the work from FC Cincinnati Foundation. Can you talk about why this is important to you personally and why it's important to FC Cincinnati. Sure, so I'll start personally. Um, I'm one of 10 kids. Um, a sister and I were the only two to graduate from college. Um, my parents uh, didn't graduate from college. Um, and m I had teachers and coaches in grade school, St. Catharines on the west side, who saw something in me that I didn't see in myself and they pushed me to St. X all my friends went to LaSalle, I went to St. X, and um, there, this mantra of men for others was transformational for me. And this notion of to whom much is given, much is expected. And I know that said a lot, I'm only just saying for me, that took hold in me. I was not a leader in high school, I played sports, I was involved, I tried to be friends with everyone. When I went to college I, at Miami University, I started to be comfortable in myself to be a, a, a leader. Um, and so I feel, and even when I was at the Bengals, I was, I mean, I served on city council while a full-time employee at the Bengals, giving back and trying to make my hometown a better place. When I was, when I was thinking maybe I would be, um, I was Soviet studies and Russian language, I studied in Russia. I, I thought I was gonna change the world through international relations. Um, and then I just decided I'm gonna change the world in my little neck of the, my corner of the earth and my hometown and I'm gonna use professional sports and my opportunities that have been presented to me to be that civic leader. So I believe, and this is a key part of FC Cincinnati, that our sports teams have an obligation to lead, inspire, and unite. Not an opportunity, an obligation. You give us your passion, you give us your, your time, of course money, we represent, like let's be honest, for a long time, what people know of Cincinnati and, and notwithstanding P&G and Kroger and our arts and everything we have is the sports teams lose a lot. <laughs> you know, I mean, Cleveland was known as the mistake on the lake and then LeBron won an NBA title and now they're called Believe Land. And th there's, a, there's a catalytic energy in Cleveland. Our sports teams have that power and so with that power, comes an obligation to lead, inspire, and unite. And so we did a community benefits agreement with the West End. With the, um, I went door to door with the residents of the West End to explain our vision and, and the partnership that we wanted. We have exceeded every, every requirement. It's why our, our development that we're now pursuing was unanimously approved by the West End Community Council because we've earned trust. Mm. And, um, that what we're about is bigger than just being a soccer team. Uh, and our employees are involved. Um, the Chamber of Commerce has the leadership programs every year. There's FC Cincinnati people in it. Um, and it's just a key part of our DNA that um, uh, we, we say FCC for all. Uh, and uh, you have to find people where they are. Um, and, um, and, and again, I said it in my thing to you know, maximize community impact. And that's different things to different people. Some employees are maximizing in the community one way or another. But if you work in our club, you're gonna feel like, I gotta find a way to be involved. We have the largest foundation 
We have the largest um, uh, community relations staff in all of Major League Soccer. And um, you know, that's because we, that's our values. So important. Thank you for embedding that into your organization and, and obviously the benefits that our whole community get from that. Um, questions on the floor? Go for it. Okay. I, yes. That's a, two good questions. The co-CEO, I'm co-CEO with Carl Lindner. So originally I was president and, and, and I'm a part of the ownership group. Uh, I'm not one of the big owners, but uh, I'm a part of the ownership group. So being an owner and the president was fine. When we were undergoing the transition and a realization that I needed to be the big picture visionary while still overseeing all the day to day, Carl thought it appropriate to name me co-CEO with, with him. Uh, in terms of the w women's team, we are having active conversations um, and we have real interest um, we have continued to be evaluating the opportunity. I, I, I will say, uh, without naming names, that uh, I met a couple years ago um, with one of the, the, the biggest business leaders in, uh, in Cincinnati, who may be represented by one of the companies that is here on the stage. <laughs> and, and this person said, core before more. Core before more, and the point—it was about a woman's team, and 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 uh, the point was you're still solidifying your core. Remember, we had in the transition lost a, a lot of matches, and we're still undergoing the leadership transition that I spoke of. And he said, "It seems to me you'd be uh, well uh, suited to just get that core really solid before you take on something as big as a woman's team." And um, and I'm going to be honest, we listened. I feel like now the core two years of winning, the leadership team largely in place, that the vision has not uh, uh, abetted, but we're, we're better suited to be able to take on something like that now. I'm going to re uh, repeat the question. Um, how do I, now that there's a broader leadership team, how do I inspire them to see my ambitious goals and make it uh, a part? The first part is in the recruitment. So we have a culture DNA code which the employees wrote, and and um, I said that the values have to be consistent with the values, but how it is manifested and how we show up in this culture DNA. I was comfortable letting the employees drive. And, it's, and it is vision equals ambition is one of the tenets. Vision equals ambition. And so the point is, is, as a part of the interview process, we want to make sure that we're hiring people who are ambitious. I always say it's easier to be mediocre. If you want to be mediocre, there's a lot of other companies to go work. Like it's, it's harder to be excellent. And excellent people don't really like working around mediocre people and same the other way. So. Recruiting the right people in is a, is a big part of it. And, that's, and I'm going to be fair, it's not easy and we've had misses and whatnot. But I, I will acknowledge, and we, we had an off-site yesterday, the, the you know, 14, 15 top leaders in the club. And this, this is a common mantra, so your question's like right at it. Is people can accept that I am going to be unyielding in my vision. And I have the support of Carl Lindner to pursue it. How we go about it, the timing of when, what is the preparation, that we have data that says that this makes sense at this time. What does the business plan look like to support it? That's where the team has to come in. And I'm going to be fair, they could convince me to amend uh, or to hold. We're not ready for this right now. Um, or in sometimes I literally just say, look, this is an opportunity. The timing is right. Carl Linder has a saying, sometimes the best opportunities in life are on someone else's timeline. 
And so if I am convinced that this is something that is very important to the community and very important uh, in terms of impact and important to our club, and I believe that we uniquely have the bandwidth to pull it off. Now, I might have to hire a couple more people, but at the end of the day, we're going to go after it. And then I have to have someone own it that supports me that says, I'll, I'm going to go make it happen. It's not always perfect. I'm going to be fair. Part of leadership evolution is there's been some conflict with that. Maybe you could hear it when I was discussing it earlier. But I think we're in a pretty good place right now.